Zion Institute is, is a place of destiny. If you want to do something for the Lord, I would really advise you to be here. We learn so many new things. More revelation and update our knowledge about drama. And Refreshers class is a very wonderful class. Daddy Mark is our main lecturer. This year, Refresher class is a very powerful one. That it divided the group into four. So in the group, we had to stage a drama and then shoot a movie. And you will be challenged because you, will see, you, you are going to see new things, innovative things that will keep you to think of doing something for God. the spirit of God moves in the midst of his people. Almighty God, we serve. You are such a faithful Father. You are an awesome God. I will forever, ever praise you. You are mighty. You are great and glorious. See oh. then. <laughs> Children are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hands of the mighty man, so are the children of thy youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed of their enemies. They shall speak with them at the gate. Mm. God, you are good. God, you are great. 
God, you're marvelous. God, you're awesome. I praise you forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To you, our Father, be all the glory. Praise the name of the Lord. children in your custody. Please make sure you don't fail God. Allow his plans and purposes for these children to fulfill. Don't fail God. But sir, why are you talking to me like this? They are my children. And my desire for them is to fulfill God's purpose. <laughs> that, my sister, is easier said than done. You need to cooperate with God. That's the only time this can be possible. You need to create time for them at this tender age so they can be properly formed and groomed to become God's arrow against his enemies. Okay, sir. The Lord will help me. Hmm. Now, this is the stage your attention is needed. Because these children are growing every day. And they must be fed. But please, hmm. feed them with godly food that will make them grow healthy spiritually so that they can become useful for God's own glory. Thanks, sir. Um, I'm, I'm grateful. In the Bible, <clears throat> Pharaoh's daughter agreed to call on the mother of Moses to help nurture baby Moses spiritually because she knew she did not have what it takes to take care of the baby spiritually, even though she was well endowed materially. But Moses grew up 
to know the God of Israel. Right in the palace of Pharaoh, through his mother. And he did not depart from that teaching throughout. Omalade. Omalade. Do not disappoint God. Do not fail God. God will help you. Please. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor. I am indeed very grateful. God bless you, sir. Hey. Hey. He said they are God's heritage. Foolish talk from a foolish man. Bible talk. Ignorant man. He talks as if he's not in this world. What does he know? When he has not crossed the boundary, to see and experience what is going on in the world. Maybe because we have not touched his child, he would have known that we have raised so many godless children to endanger the peace of the society. Even out of godly homes, we can raise godless children. Like Prophet Eli's son? Yes! <laughs> Our strategy is to capture them early before they become arrow in God's hand that we fight our kingdom. Their minds are empty now mm. and we have to quickly attack them before their parents wake up from their slumber. Mm. We need to attack them, to attack the home, occupy them with ungodly activities. Let the home be broken from the inside so that the destinies of their children can be tampered with. Hmm. Alade, you mean unfair? No, no, try and understand. No, I'm not going to take that from you. Oh, Alade, try you mean unfair? No. Alade, I won't. I won't. No problem. If that is what you want, no problem. It's okay by me. Thank you. What are you still doing here? I can get inside and go and sleep now. No, mm, we are not sleeping yet. We have not prayed. Oh. You better get inside before I lose my temper. Now! Mommy, why are you angry with daddy? Will you shut up your mouth and get inside your room now? Get inside! Oh, silly! See? Daddy, try and understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you should not travel to buy your goods. But you cannot continue to leave these children with me. Your traveling is becoming too often. And these children are still young. They need you. They need you at this time. Please, understand now. Oh, are we not the one praying for expansion? Is this not an answer to a prayer? Before, I used to travel to Dubai twice a year. Now, the demanding is increasing. Are you not supposed to be grateful? Here you are. You are complaining. I am not complaining. I am only really concerned about the way you are treating these children. Look at me. They need you at this stage. They need you more, even more than they need me. Please understand now. Eh? You're talking about the children. Oh, do you know how much you pay for their school fees? Where do you think the money we pay for their school fees come from? And even the one we pay for this house, do you know how much we pay? Or do you think your salary is enough to cater for all this? Of recent, your brother got a land for us, and we have to pay. And you even said we have to start building our own house. Where do you think all this money comes from? From your meager salary. Look, I understand, but... No, you don't. Because if you do, you won't go and report me to the pastor. I see but I hate my own children. Eh? And like, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do? What? My wife, my dear. Oh, Monlade. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you see, I have to take that step because I noticed you were no longer taking me serious on this issue. Eh? I know you are trying, in fairness, you are trying. But this business, most especially the traveling, is taking most of your time. See, remember you promised me that you're going to do something about it. You have not done that up till now. Please, please, just 
I want these children. This stage, they need you more than me. Please. Okay, okay, okay. You want me to stay at home and stay with the children? No problem. Or what? I am not saying you should stop traveling. But then you can reduce it to like twice in a year. I'll be fine with that. Eh? Uh, babe, <laughs> try to understand, eh? Please try to understand. Try and accommodate these children in your plans. Eh? Please. <laughs> come on, come on. But so much for um, allowing us to uh, be a blessing. We, we thank God for uh, the life of Mami, the, the crew. Uh, we're excited to be here again and also uh, to speak in the Family Life series. So thank you so much. Now, if you look at the, the program we are doing, it's called the Family Life series. And so the question you ask is actually in order because if you look at um, uh, the family life, um, the family is very important. The, the component of the family is very, very important. You can't, you can't do away with the family, you see. Now, there is a purpose for family. In fact, yesterday I, I was having a discussion with Mami were pre-discussing this topic before today and I was I remember telling her that the family is one of the most oldest institution mm -hmm. even older than the church mm -hmm. okay and so there is a purpose for the family there is a purpose why the family exists okay and so there are principles and there are rules that the family or is expected of the family and that is why i believe that this program is actually championing that cause to really advocate and tell our viewers and those who are watching us that there is a purpose for family and that was why god created the family now the reason why we talk about family or we talk about the purpose of family, okay, is that God has a concept for family. And that concept is called the kingdom concept of family, or the kingdom concept 
of defining what family is all about. Now, as I intimated from the genesis of my presentation, I said that there is a purpose for the family. There is a reason for the existence of the family. The family didn't just come uh, by coincidence. There is a purpose why God instituted the family. But you see, the devil knows that the family is a very powerful tool. And so everything that God created or God intends for the family, the devil also tries to fight it. That is why my mommy and I were sharing yesterday that if you look at the family, for instance, if you look at people called arm robbers, people who are called prostitutes, people who are called dropouts in society, or what we call them the deviants of society, they are, were all product of the family or a distorted family that produced all these deviants. Mm -hmm. And so the devil knows that the only way he can attack a community is through the family. The devil knows that the only way he can attack a nation is through the family. The devil knows that even if he wants to attack the church, one of the ways the devil can attack the church is to weaken the concept of family. And one of the ways the devil is using to weaken the concept of family is now when Steve and Steve is getting married. All these Steve and Steve getting married and Maria and Miriam getting married is all part of Satan's concept to destroy the family. You understand? It's part of Satan's agenda to destroy the family. But you see, the reason why we need to teach this concept about family, for people to understand what uh, the kingdom mandate for family is all about, is because a lot of people lack the understanding to what family is about. Now, I was telling mommy the other time, and I, I always like to back whatever I do with the scriptures. So if you don't mind, this is Proverbs 24. If you can read it for me, Proverbs 24, verse 3 to 5, if you can read it for me. 5? Yes, 3 to 5. 3 to 5, okay. So I read, take away the wicked from before. Proverbs 24, 3 to 5. 24, 3 to 5. 24 is there. This will be 3 to 5. Verse 3 to 5. Take away the wicked. No, this 24, 3 is there. You see, the, the concept of family is, or the kingdom family concept is actually a concept to help human development. You understand? So what we are doing is not just a Christian program we are doing. We are doing a program to be able to help in the human development. In the human development. Now, you read Proverbs 24, verse 3. Can you read it again? The verse 3. Yeah. Through wisdom yeah. and house build it. So through wisdom a house is built. Now, in this concept of family, one of the most important thing about family is knowledge. So what mommy and I we are doing, we, we have other things to do with our we have other things to do with our time. You understand? We have other things to do with our time. But we are here as part of our effort to help in human development because if the concept of family is not properly taught for people to get knowledge, that is how come the system of the family is broken because at the end of the day, people are getting married every day, people are having children every day, so, and yet crimes and other things are increasing every day. And so what the family concept is all about is to give people knowledge because you see one of the things we need to understand about the family is that mommy will tell you from experience that when you marry to a point you notice that love doesn't work again it's no more about love 
So it tells you that love is not enough to maintain a marriage or maintain a relationship. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, because if, if you can love somebody, you can cherish somebody, but if the person lacks the understanding about marriage, what marriage is all about, what the family concept is all about, the person goes into marriage thinking that love alone is enough to sustain the marriage. It doesn't work that way. The same thing applies to sex. If you go into marriage and your entire concept thinks that, oh, he's good in bed or she's good in bed, after a while, you realize that the marriage is beyond just sex. And so you need knowledge to be able to know how to be able to handle your marriage. And you see, the problem why a lot of marriages are not working, let me tell you, is because people are in a hurry to get married without necessarily building a foundation of understanding this concept called marriage. And so they don't have the knowledge. And you read it rightly there. It says what? By what? Wisdom. By wisdom. Now, 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 what is wisdom? When we talk about wisdom, Wisdom is applied knowledge. When you apply the knowledge you know about marriage, then you acquire wisdom. That is why you can see two, three people who are married. They love themselves, but yet they want a divorce. Today, this morning, I was handling the same case like that. The woman says the man is good, the man says the woman is good. So why are they divorcing? Why can't the two of them stand each other? It's because the man lacks knowledge of how to handle his wife. And the woman also lacks knowledge of how to handle the husband. And you see, I tell people all the time that a little ignorance of something, if you're ignorant about something, it will cost you a lot of distractions and so it is important that whatever you want to adventure into like for instance you are single at least you are blessed because you are hosting this program mommy and i were discussing you were saying you are those of you are handling now evans has come to join the team it he's blessed because he's going to be learning a lot of things you see whatever you want to go into that's why mommy and i we always thank god for Eli's life you know why because for, the, for her, the thing she's hearing, her standard is going to be very high. <laughs> do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? So it means that, what I'm trying to say is that, whatever you want to go into, I was sharing with mommy that, see, I go to school for about 20 years to get a degree. Look at the school process I go through. From kindergarten to primary school, then from primary school, to maybe JSS, from JSS to SS, to grade, whatever, then you go to university, get a first degree, second degree, or even a master's degree and all these things. In all of this marriage, whatever, you are never, in all of your school days, you are never taught anything about marriage. But do you know that in this life, there are two things that can make you in this life, and not make you. One is your salvation. The second one is who you marry, but yet you are not taught in any way. Even in the church, only few churches or men of God or pastors have the courage to even talk about marriage. So the only time you see people going to get married, if the only time you see people going through pre-counseling, is only when now they are getting married. A lot of churches don't talk about marriage. They don't talk about relationships. They don't talk about sex. They don't talk about anything because those topics are like an abominable topics in the church unless somebody is going to get married. Now, even in the church, when somebody is going to get married, how many months do we tell the people? We tell the people, tell me for we started with six months. Ah, people started agitating. Six months is too much. But I was studying the scripture when I was doing the research on this topic and studying. I was telling mommy that normally the average time, the average period for counseling is one year. Before you get married, the average should be one year counseling before you get married. And so people are getting married 
they don't even know what they are entering into. Like you are single right now. There are many singles when you ask them, when are they going to get married? How many books have you read? Have you read on marriage? They can't tell you because they don't even know. They don't even know the scriptures that pertains to marriage. And yet, all they are thinking about is the ceremony of the a long cake with 10 flower girls, 20 best men, doing an extravagant wedding, and everybody. But you see, the wedding is just an event. This is a lifetime thing that is going to determine your destiny. Your destiny is going to determine your entire destiny. And yet, people don't learn about it. But look at somebody who becomes a medical doctor. He goes to school all his life to become a medical doctor. Before you gain a degree, look at the stress you went through. But marriage, that is supposed to determine your next level in life. Yet, people are divorcing. You know why the divorce rate has increased? Not only among unbelievers, I'm talking about even believers who are divorcing every day because the church has failed to spend more time to teach people about the concept of marriage. That marriage is not the tel I see it all the time, you guys laugh, but it's the truth. Marriage is not the telenovela you watch on television. It is not the Mexican opera that you watch on television. It's not the uh, love story you watch on television. Marriage is a different story altogether. And just like you go to school to go and learn about marriage, it is uh, you learn about other things. It is important that we understand what marriage is all about. So it is important that information. That, so that is why you need information to what you are entering into. You don't just go into it because it is nice. Oh, I, I feel it's nice to wear a wedding ring and I, I, me too, mm -hmm. I show it. Everybody say I'm also Mrs. When you don't even know. And you see, what people don't know is that even driving license, look at driving license in this country. Many of you, my producer, my two producers, my three, Producers, apart from Ella, who can drive, the two can drive. But it is not easy to get a license in this country. And so you you see that many there are few accidents in this country because they make it difficult for you to get a license mm -hmm. to drive. But yet, even in Ghana or elsewhere, Ghana too is difficult. But look at marriage. You can go into a marriage. You can, the two of you can decide right now. I want to be married. Go to AMA or go to some place right now. Get somebody to officiate your marriage. You are married. And so it is important that people are taught the right application and given the right knowledge as to what marriage is about before they enter. Maybe mommy and I may not have had the privilege to know it. And so that is why we are trying to educate people, tell you that it is not just the event. Marriage goes, it's about destiny. You understand? That is why I keep saying that real men marry for purpose. Real women marry for purpose. You don't marry because it is nice to get married. That is where, because even, that's what we're talking about, the children. That we'll come to that one. Mm -hmm. you, you understand? Mm -hmm. Because if a person does not even know anything about marriage, how does the person even raise godly children? Because if you don't have knowledge about uh, marriage, how do, you, I mean, how do you even know about how to raise a child in a godly way when you don't even know the basics of what marriage is all about? Mm -hmm. do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? So it is important that we comprehend the concept of what marriage is all about. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. Now, the, as I said earlier, if we can get the family in order, for instance, when I'm talking about getting the family in order, I'm talking about where churches, institutions take up responsibility. Do you know, do you know the number of, statistically, all over the world, it is proven that in a month, out of 10 marriages in a month, eight of them get divorced mm -hmm. every day. Eight gets divorced every day, statistically. Now, out of these divorce cases brings prostitution. People become prostitutes because they are coming from broken homes. People become drunkards. People become deviant of society, armed robbers. 
419, criminals. Now, all these people are defect of the family because they are coming from broken homes. They are coming from homes where maybe the man and the woman are divorced and separated. Now, can you imagine? Because you see, the family is the smallest unit in society, but yet so powerful. Because if you have several families, they form a community. If you have extended several families, they form a nation. So imagine if we get the family right and people are taught properly about what marriage is about. Before they go into it, they go through the proper process of pre-marital counseling and they are taught what marriage is about properly. Then it means that the number of people that go to jail will decrease. The number of people that go to jail will increase, decrease. Mm -hmm. The number of prostitutes that we see on the street will decrease. Mm -hmm. the, the number of people who are, uh, who are coming from uh, uh, homes that are broken and all that, the number will substantially decrease. You know why? Because then the home, we are getting it right. Mm -hmm. You understand? And so that is why this topic is important because if the family doesn't get it right, all the time we'll have the challenge of battling with this deviant of society where now we sit back and the, and the country or the, the nation have to pump money. Do you know how many amount of budget and money is spent in rehabilitation for the youth who are alcoholics and dropouts and people are in prison? The money that government spends just to be able to feed people in prison and all that, it will substantially decrease. Do you understand what I'm saying? If the, because if, in the family party, that is where the child, that's the planting stage, where the child is taught all the basics and what is important for the child to learn. Mm -hmm. So if the child is able to get it right from the beginning, it means that that child is growing up to know what is right and to do the right thing. And that is why the family unit is so crucial and so important in this 21st century. It's so important because that is why the devil is doing everything possible to disentangle the family. Yes, this, the, in these times, if you look at the agenda of Satan, he is doing everything possible to disentangle the family, to bring confusion among husbands and wives, misunderstanding so that they get separated and they are divorced. You see? And so it is important. That is why you cannot give your child the, the reason why God created a family is because every family is responsible for the life of the child. I was sharing something with mommy today. Uh, it was yesterday. Yesterday, and she was so quiet, reflecting. I was saying that children are a gift from God. And so we who are parents of those children, those children don't, they don't belong to us. We are only steward of those children. The children, they don't belong to us even one bit. Mm -hmm. And so, we are responsible for the children and we will give an account of these children. And so, if you don't understand the concept of family, to understand that you, the parent, it is your responsibility to raise these children in a godly way. And you leave that responsibility for a third party or somebody else to raise for you then you are in big trouble. Because at the end of the day, whether it is the teacher who is raising the child, or whether it is the principal or a maid servant who is staying with you who is raising the child for you, at the end of the day, all those people who are playing a role in the life of the child, raising the child, are not going to be held responsible. It's you, the parents, that are going to be held responsible because you are a steward. That child does not belong to you. The child belongs to God. And so that is why God gives you a manual, the Bible, as a standard of guide to help you to be able to raise that child in a godly way. Mm -hmm. And so, Kofi Ahmad, or whatever your daughter or your child's name is, you are not the owner of that child. That child belongs to God. You are only a conduit that God used to raise that child and bring that child into effect, actually. So it is crucial and important that when it comes to the family unit, we have to really 
Learn about it. Because let me tell you, one of the currency of raising godly children is knowledge. If you lack knowledge about family, and you saw maybe your father and mother, the way they raised you, and you want to use the same principle, because many of us, our parents raised that they didn't use the Bible in raising us. Imagine I was sharing with mommy when I was growing, I was young as Ella. My father used to send me uh, uh, to go and buy hard liquor. And when I brought the hard liquor, I was given a cutter to sip because my father says that when you sip the cutter, before you eat, it kills all the gems mm -hmm. in your stomach and it makes you to eat. Now, if I had not been for the grace of God, what do you think I would have become? Mm -hmm. I would become an alcoholic. It is just the grace of God that I don't drink. I, I grew up in family settings where I was I was sent as a child to go and uh, buy weed and give weed to people, drugs to people. What would I have become? I would have become a drug addict or I would have become a drug dealer. And so the family unit is important because you don't know who is influencing your child. Mm -hmm. And that is why a lot of people need to understand what the family is about. If you look at the Greek meaning of family, the Greek meaning of family means to dwell at home. If you look at the Hebrew meaning, which is sa'et, sa'et means that people of the same lineage, people of the same lineage. So what it means is that God created the family as a unit to reproduce his nature. And that is the essence of the family, to reproduce God's nature in the children. And so the family is very important. The, fa the family is so important that you, you, if, if we miss it there, we have a very big problem. Because if, if you take the family unit, many of the people who uh, you see them and you, you call them names, maybe prostitutes, and all that. They are all defect of society because the family failed. Mm -hmm. You understand? And so it is important that people understand the family concept and know that the family unit is the first unit all of us grew up from. So you are a product of your family. So if you are brought up in a godly way, so if you see someone who is a prostitute, she's a product of her family. If somebody becomes good, it's a product. So you are a product of your family. You, you understand what I'm saying? And so it is important that we understand what family is all about. Mm -hmm. We understand. I don't want to be the one to talk here. Mama, what's the purpose of family? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the Bible, the verse you read, the Bible said, um, by wisdom, a home is built. So I believe that when a couple gets married, start asking God for wisdom and knowledge because it's only God that gives wisdom and also ask God for the fear of God so that you can be able to raise the child the way the Bible says we should raise a child because I believe that as a parent the child will look up to you you know the child will look up to you so if you're a parent and the fear of God is not in you, the fear of God is not in you. Eh? You, don't, you don't ask God for wisdom and understanding for you to raise your children. That is what happened. Papa said you have children who are arm robbers, thieves, and etc. etc. You see, so when you got married. You have to ask God for wisdom. And also you, the parents, you have the responsibility to learn the Bible so that you can be able to impact your children. You know, the Bible said in Ephesians that children obey your parents in the law. Mm -hmm. So if you are a child, you um, sorry, if you are a parent and you yourself, you don't fear God. You know, you don't walk 
You don't do things that the word of God said you should do. It will be difficult for you to raise, to raise your children the way God wants you to raise them, your child. So I believe that in the beginning is wisdom. So you start, the right moment you guys got married, you have to start praying that God should give you wisdom and understanding. And God should also teach you how to raise your child. Many parents fail because they themselves don't know the Bible. They don't teach, they don't do things in the house that the child will see or look up to. So the children go up and go and learn from their friends and uh, their teachers, you know, as Papa said. So I believe that when you as a parent one, if you are preparing to get married, then you have to know that when you get married and you start giving birth, child also will, will be having children. So whilst you are praying for your marriage and those things, you, have to, you also have to pray that God should give you wisdom. And when a child starts coming in, you can be able to raise your child the way God wants you to do. Because someone said, you are going to account for the children. Yeah, you're going to account, yeah. So if you are going to account for the children, that means you have a big, very big responsibility. Very big. You know, very big. So I want, I, what I would add is we should pray for wisdom as parents. We should pray for wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the presence of God to be able to direct the children that we can lead the children in the right path. Papa, talking about responsibility or taking it serious for our kids or children, what about people who don't have kids but they adopt other people's kids, like from their orphanage home and all that? So, for example, I don't have a kid and I, I go and adopt from the orphanage. Am I responsible um, or am I accountable for that kid that I will adopt? Yes. Because I'm not the one who will give birth. One, once you... Biologically. If, yes, the person who adopted the child, mm -hmm. you, the person who gave birth to the child, if the person is dead, then that is a different ballgame because the person is no more. Okay. So once you have adopted the, ch the, the, the child, it means that now you are the one who is in charge of that child. So God sees you as the biological parent of the mm -hmm. child. Is entirely if the person is still alive and maybe abandoned the child. I was telling mommy yesterday that the person, when when you abandon your child and you don't take care of your child, you will pay for the responsibility. Yes, you God will deal with you for abandoning your child. That one is a is a is a must. You 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 pay for it. But if you go and adopt a child, once you have adopted the child, God sees you as the parent. So it applies to you because you are the one guiding the child. You've taken responsibility over the child. So the document you sign, the process you go through, God respects that. And so therefore, you, you are held responsible for the child. Mm -hmm. Yes, the path you create for the child is important. Now, to add to mommy, before maybe if you have another question to ask, mm -hmm. to add to what mommy said, you see, one of the most important things about the family is that that is why the role of the man is important. Because the man is the priest. Under normal circumstances, when it comes to marriage, before you, you marry a man. The man has to be somebody who fears God. We, we've said all those things. Because if the person doesn't fear God, the man cannot even help you, the woman, talkless of helping your children. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at Adam and Eve, Adam was in the presence of God before God gave him Eve. So the man must always be in God's presence to be able to shape Eve. Because you see, one of the things I've learned over years of marriage is that, you see what mommy is doing today? It took us 10 years to get where we are. Now, I had a vision of today, of she doing this. But it, it had to take gradual to shape that vision that you are seeing today that she's seated here. It has not been an easy journey. 
And so God will never give you a woman who is perfect. Women are never finished product. Women are never uh, raw product. They are always finished product. Every woman, even if the woman is an intellectual, she is not a finished product. It is your responsibility as a man to keep managing her to bring her to that level. Mm. No, she can be very outspoken, go to university. The fact that somebody goes to university does not mean that the person can sit here and do what one needs to do. The fact that you have a master's degree does not mean you can sit here and do it. It, it, it needs nurturing. So whoever you want to get married to, when you marry the person, you the man, you are like a manager. Like how uh, footballers have a manager and people have to keep managing your wife. To what you have, you have envisaged in your vision of her becoming for you. You understand? Mm -hmm. And so the man must always be in the presence of God because the man is the priest. And so God does, God never will give any woman to you who knows it all. No. That is why the, the woman doesn't come with her vision. Any man who marries you is marrying you for his vision. Why is marrying you? That is why we said that when you are marrying that man, you have to find out whether do my vision fall in alignment with his vision that he's, he can lead me and in leading me and me submitting to his vision, I can become what God has ordained me also to become. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? So immediately you enter the marriage, you submit to the man's vision. And submitting to the man's vision means that you have placed yourself in a position where you've decided that this man is my manager. Let him manage me. That is how God created it. For God, for the man to manage the woman. So the man's responsibility is to be in God's presence. That's why the threefold call. He is in God's presence. He receives on behalf of the family and he manages everybody, including his children. By drawing them into the presence of God all the time in prayer, in waiting on the Lord, in reading the Bible, and studying the word of God together. That is why when that day comes and God is going to judge the family, the first person that he judges is the man. Because he's the priest. So the man, so imagine you are going to marry a man who only thinks about the bottle, alcohol, clubbing, spending money with friends, being around friends, and does not know the word of God. I was sharing with mommy yesterday that one of the greatest tragedies that can happen to any woman is to marry blindly, the, I love you, is good in sex. And you don't marry a man who fears God. You are finished. You, it's like you have thrown your destiny away. Any man who cannot quote scriptures, who doesn't love God, and does not have the fear of God, if you marry that man, you are in big trouble. You are in big trouble because he cannot even receive from God for him to even impart his own children. And so you need the presence of God. If you want the presence of God always in your home, one of the areas you have to look at as a woman is to always make sure that you are marrying a God-fearing man. If you a woman, if you're a man and you want the presence of God to always be in your home, one of the things you have to look out for is that you are marrying a God-fearing man or a God-fearing woman. Or else you are in a very, very big trouble. And so, to add to what um, Mami said, knowledge is important because the Bible says by wisdom a house is built. By understanding, the house is established. Now, let, let me show you something a little about what the Bible talks about understanding. Now, Understanding means to be able to comprehend. Like for instance, I can go to school. They can be teaching uh, board maths. I can be in the class and the master will teach the thing, but I don't understand what the master taught. But I was in the class. They taught it. Yet I didn't comprehend what the master taught. Mm -hmm. So you can come from a Christian background. You can go to church all right. You can even be taught marriage, but you may not even understand marriage. So when we are talking about understanding, or we are talking about knowledge, we are talking about not just information, but we are talking about understanding or comprehending that information is what will be able to establish that family. So wisdom, I wrote it here, wisdom is the application of what you understand 
So what you understand about marriage, the right things you understand about marriage, when you apply them, then you can be able to sustain your marriage. People don't prepare to get married. A lot of people, you ask how many young people right now, everyone is there, he's single. Ask how many books he has read about marriage. How many seminars he has gone to about marriage. So, he, he doesn't know much about marriage. Maybe the only ones he knows is the ones he watched on Nigerian movie and, 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 mm -hmm. and maybe a Mexican or when he was growing up and he saw his mother and father. That's all he knows about marriage. So if he saw his father and mother beating each other, he sees that normal. So when he marries you, <laughs> he will beat you. Because that is what he knows about marriage. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So before you go into any marriage, you have to learn about it. If you go to school and you can spend 20 years in learning about something to graduate, just get a paper, then you are going to something that determines your entire destiny in life and you have no idea about it. It's, 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 it's a big problem. Mm. It's a big problem. I will end here. So, what, what is kingdom parenting? What okay. is kingdom parenting? When, when we talk about parenting in the kingdom, you see, one of the things about kingdom parenting is parenting your child in a way that pleases God. That is what we talk about. When we're talking about kingdom parenting, we are talking about you guiding that child, like I'm guiding Ella, in the way that it pleases God. Look at Ella. Ella is more intelligent in all this software than all of us here. I was telling Eva today, the things she can do Production and other things. Me, I don't even have one idea. Do you know how God may be proud of me hey, right now? That he, this small girl can, is producing a product that the, the whole world is consuming. So your ability to be able to raise those child or those children in a way that it pleases God that they are also learning the work of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, all my children, even, even David, I'm telling you, ask mommy, when we're going to sleep, mommy will say, David, you are praying, come and see. Daddy, mommy, daddy, Pearl, he's praying for everybody. <laughs> you understand? So, when we are talking about kingdom parenting, we are talking about Guiding that child and leading that child in the way of the Lord that is pleasing in the sight of God. And that's what we call kingdom parenting. Now, in kingdom parenting, I still come back to knowledge about what marriage is about. If you don't know what marriage is about, because marriage is a holistic thing. Marriage is not just talking about kingdom parenting. But marriage is talking about even how to raise children, godly children. And so, in kingdom parenting, there are three things that God requires from us. That is one. One. Let me read Genesis for the sake of, because I, I try as much as possible to ensure that we are not doing a worldly thing. We are not doing a worldly thing. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. We're going to finish up if it's possible. Genesis 1, 26. Genesis 1, verse number 26. Do you want us to go on the commercial break? Oh, okay. What, what is the problem? If we... And sometimes it can... God richly bless you for your tremendous... <laughs>
she said your son your son is the one responsible for the pregnancy and that they were friends on campus bastard fool come out here and explain yourself to the house uh, uh, that's okay sir that's all right uh, all we need from her is to find out if actually that is the truth come out and explain to them if we have been telling lies or did you pick the pregnancy from the floor but that is not a issue man we need to hear from her mouth because we are seeing her for the first time ah oh billy let me see her for the first time are you no longer by your mother ha hey have you not been sending for juby to buy clothes for her <laughs> now that she's pregnant for your son you are not denying if you fail to properly train your son eh? you shouldn't tell lies so you want to tell lies to cover your your son's shameless ass mm -hmm. buy clothes for your daughter what is the meaning of all this thing you are saying what is wrong with this woman eh? can you imagine what are you saying do you want to beat me? Hey, nonsense. If you had trained your son properly, he would not have been eating what belongs to an elder. At this age of his, this tiny thing. Anyway, it is not your fault. See your life. Jubi, see yourself. Eh? Oh, many bad journey. Eh? Look at you. Shameless girl. I'm not responsible for this. She's lying. She is lying. We are just friends. She has a steady boyfriend. An army officer. Who rented an apartment for her outside the school? Ah! He beat me mercilessly. The guy visited her. Shut up! Stop telling lies! I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I've never done this before. She lured me into it. Just that. I did it just once. Aha. You see? You see? Just that once is enough to father a child. So, you better stop all this your lies and face realities. Jimmy has only one boyfriend in the campus. And that is you. Abi, Jimmy, do you have anything to say to this? He's the only one I have. Welcome back, welcome back. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you. And then as we were here with the kind of parenting your children in the godly way. And uh, while the program is going on, we want you to please can start asking your questions and I promise we're going to answer you on that. So, Papa and Mommy, I want to ask, like, before we're talking about kingdom parenting. Yes. So, I want to read a scripture mm -hmm. in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Now, if, if it's your own Bible, I want you to underline the word after our likeness. And so for, for kingdom parenting, God expects us to be effective in, the, in that parenting. Effectiveness of parenting is of God. And so God expects you to raise that child in the image of God. Okay, so the Bible said, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the earth, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeped upon the earth. And so, number one, when it comes to the issue of parenting, 
or what we call kingdom parenting. God expects effectiveness. You, the parent, to be effective in raising that child. Because you see, God created man in our image, in his image. You understand? After his kind. And God gives we, the parent, the mandate to also recreate after our kind. But in a godly manner. And so, therefore, God expects that as a couple, you must be effective in raising that child to fulfill God's mandate. You must be effective in raising that child, in fulfilling God's mandate. So if you're not effective in raising that child, that is where Nomi and I are saying that God is going to require the blood of that child from you because you were not effective enough in raising that child in a godly way. Because God expects you. That is why he said, let us make man in our likeness. So God expects you to raise the child in a likeness that is pleasing to God. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why I said kingdom parenting is raising a child in a way that it pleases God in, the, in that manner. Now, the Bible says that, then God says, be fruitful and multiply. And so God expects that in your effectiveness in raising those children, those children must have the image of Christ. They must bear the image of God. So therefore, the, you cannot raise a drunkard. You cannot raise an armed robber. You cannot raise a prostitute and say, this is my child. I present him to God. <laughs> you understand? God expects you to raise godly children. And that is why you have to be effective in, in, in parenting those children. You understand? The second thing is to reproduce character in that child. You understand? You, you reproduce character. Now, what I'm saying that, the first one, God says, be effective in the parenting. And being effective means that raise that child in the likeness of God. In the image of God. You understand? Meaning that you inculcate the fear of God in that child. Right from the time the child is growing up. The next step of the parenting is that God expects you to reproduce the God character in that child. So that is what mommy is saying. That if you yourself you lack character. You don't have character in terms of maybe you are a liar. You are a thief. You are somebody who is not a man of your word. You lack integrity. What kind of values or moral values are you going to imbibe in the child? Because somebody is coming and you tell your child, tell the child, tell the person I'm not around. And I was telling mommy yesterday that children don't learn by what you tell them. Oh, Ella, don't steal. You lie. Ella will not listen to you. Ella, don't do this. Ella will not mind you. But where Ella will take you serious is when Ella sees that you've done something wrong and daddy caught you. Then you tell, oh daddy, I'm sorry, I did it. Then Ella is upset, oh okay. Telling a lie is not good. You see, mommy was even caught. But he told daddy the truth that he did it. Okay, it's a virtue you have to learn. So children, that's what we call it, the planting stage. Children learn by observation. So when they are growing, I was telling mommy yesterday, we were discussing this topic before the main, before today. That sometimes we, she and I were discussing before the program. And I was telling her that by the time the child is growing to 12, 14 at most, whatever the child needs to learn, he has already learned it. So, so you see, one of the things a lot of people don't know is the Adamic nature of every child. Like David, my, my, my younger child. He's just two years old. Nobody teaches him how to lie. But give him three, four years, he'll start lying. If, and you, you think that he learned the lying through some, he didn't learn it anyway. Because it's the Adamic nature in him. Nobody teaches a child to bully. He bullies because it's a, an Adamic nature in him. Nobody teaches the child to be bad, but the child becomes bad when he's growing up because it's the Adamic nature in the child. Do you understand? So what I'm saying is that your duty as kingdom parent in raising that child 
is to be able to ensure that you reproduce good character, the character of God in that child. Because remember we said that the child does not belong to you. Sometimes we say, oh, my, my child Ella, my child Pearl. The truth of the matter is that those children don't belong to us. They don't belong to us in the first place. The child doesn't belong to you. You are only a conduit. You are only a means through which God brought this child into me. So you are still one. The child actually belongs to God. That's why God gives you the manual, which is the Bible, in telling you that use this Bible or use this manual in raising the child. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you have to be effective because it is a mandate from God for you to raise that child in the fear of God. You understand what I'm saying? And the likeness of God and to reproduce the nature of God in that child because you also represent the nature of God. You understand what I'm saying? The second one is that that child must reflect you. That is why there's a tree saying that Okotomo Anoma. So if the child is a criminal, the father is a criminal. It's likely the father, what the, the father would think the child has to be criminal. That's why many parents who the child, the father is a criminal, the child is also a, likely to become a criminal. If the mother is a prostitute, the likelihood for the, the person to also become a prostitute because you produce after your kind. And so God expects you to reproduce character, integrity in that child, to teach the child how to speak truth. Then the third one is to reproduce behavior. The behavior you exhibit speaks volumes of you to the child. Your behavior. So whatever the child, remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, I and my father are one. And Jesus said, if you see me, you have seen my father. And so, if people look at your child, they should be able to see you in that child. And that is where behavior comes in. That is why you study most movies, when you watch, before they go and do DNA, they bounce it. Mm. If you look at the behavior of the child, I don't think this one is my child. Then the man or the woman go, the man goes ahead to do a DNA because if he looks at the behavior of the child, he can tell that no, this is not my seed. Do you understand? So the behavior of the child is also important. You see, the behavior of the child. And so it is important that as parents, we must create an environment where a godly environment where the presence of God dwells which the Bible describes as Eden. Eden is not a place. You understand? When we talk about the Garden of Eden, people think that the Garden of Eden is talking about a place. And the truth is that the Garden of Eden is not a place. Archaeologists have tried to research. There's no place called Eden. And so Eden actually represents the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence, the, a place where the presence of God dwells. And so the Bible said when God created man, he placed man and the woman in the Garden of Eden. It is not talking about a physical place. It's talking about a place where God's presence dwells. And so, therefore, God expects that when we start raising, to, for us to be able to raise godly children, we must create an environment where the presence, number one, the presence of God dwells. Because the child is going to learn from that. That is the beginning stage. So the child grows up, he sees mommy and daddy doing devotion. He sees money and daddy praying all the time. He sees them. So that is the ambience that God expects us to raise children. And an environment of love. When I'm talking about love, we are talking about care for that child. Where the child is in an environment where the child feels that I am loved, I am cared for. Mommy has my back, daddy has my back. That is what God, um, when we talk about kingdom parenting, that is what it's all about. I would like mommy to say something, then I'll add to it again. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. up in the morning 
and praying your child is watching. You know, whatever you do, whether you talk to your husband rudely or uh, your husband beats you, your child is also watching. watching yeah. You know, it's also watching. So we, it is very important that your home must be a home that when a child wake up in the morning, he feels that where he is, she, he or she is safe. Is safe. Yeah. And he or she is loved. You know. So as a parent, we have a very big responsibility. You know, what do you do at home? What do you do at home? Your child is watching everything you do. That you know. Yeah. That's and unfortunately, we have very intelligent children, I tell you. <laughs> they, even, they even have diaries. They write everything that happens. And you'll be shocked. <laughs> so your, child, your children are watching you as a parent. You know, as a papa said something, he said, when you are going to get married, don't just marry because people are getting married. Marry a man that will help you. Get to where God wants you as a lady to get to. You know, so it is very important that you play a role, a very good role in the house for your children to watch so that they can learn, they can learn and also be a child that God wants them to be. Because if they go outside, whatever they do represents you. Represents you, so I would say that we parents we have a huge responsibility. responsibility. Yeah. May God help us. And 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 one of the things um, Mommy said, which struck me, is that you need to understand that children learn by example. So whatever you are doing around them, they learn. Do you know that? For me, I I, I was saying something about David, my my two year old. Because of my nature as a pastor and my, my environment in an ugly, normally when I'm talking, it's like, even when I'm being broadcast, you guys say all the time I'm serious, I'm shouting. <laughs> Hester and uh, mommy will say, all the time, even when you're giving a prayer, you're too serious. You're like, God, because what, whatever I do, I do it with passion. But do you know that I noticed something about David? Even when he's also talking, mm. I said, like, ah! like, hey, that is me. <laughs> so you see, two years. He has already learned how his father talks. You study the when he's even talking. Two years. You, you, you understand? So, so, so you see, when people, children learn by example. They don't learn by what you tell them. Ella, don't do this. David, don't do this. So he's learning by what he's seeing. You understand? He's learning by what he says. So, Godly parenting helps to shape the attitude. Now, one thing about kingdom parenting or godly parenting. Kingdom parenting is the same as godly parenting. Kingdom parenting or godly parenting helps to shape, number one, the actions of the child, the attitude of the child by what he imitates. You, the parents, because you are the first person he sees every morning. Every day, you are the ones he sees. And so, it is important that you raise the children in the way that they don't imitate even you because you are far away. That is why you don't raise children and say, oh, let the children copy my example. No. The children must imitate God. So, that is why God expects you to do what? To always raise them in the fear of God. Now, let me, let me see whether uh, I'll find the scripture. I'm trying to remember the scripture so that I'll go to Ephesians 5, verse 1 to 2. Ephesians 5, 1 to 2. It said, Be ye followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us, and had given himself for us as an offering a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling sour. And so God expects us, okay, to 
be followers of him as dear children. And so it is, it is very important that your, you have to understand that your attitude is what is shaping that child. Your actions determines the action of the child. Your behavior determines the behavior of the child. So if you want the child to imitate God, then you must teach the word of God to that child. So that that child will be able to walk in the statute of God. I don't know whether I'm making sense. Then also, when it comes to kingdom purity, it has to be intentional. When I'm talking about intentional, it means that before you go into the purity, you need to learn about purity. Because some of us, if we wanted to use the yardstick of how our fathers and mothers raised us, we'll be repeating the same mistake of history. Because now, these children, they, their mentality has changed. Like for instance, uh, David knows my phone more than me, but he's just two years. He, he knows my phone better than me. You understand what I'm saying? So it tells you that the children now, they are entirely, their mentality, their way of thinking is entirely different. So if you want to apply the same principles without applying God's word, of how you were raised by maybe your ungodly mother or your ungodly father, you'll be making the biggest mistake of your life. And so you have to be intentional about it. When I'm talking about being intentional, what it means that you have to prepare yourself as a mother and as a father. You have to learn about parents. I remember before uh, Ella came in, those days I remember I used to be on the internet all the time, read about parents. I, I remember one time I did bought mommy a book on parenting just for her to read about how, you know, uh, to know about children, how to the psychology of children when they start coming, what to do, and the rest. Because you have to be intentional about it. You have to learn about how to handle children. You, you, you understand? Or else, look, look at. Let me give an example. Already, right, David, all of my children, they, they spot so many things. Like David style, for instance, he spot two very expensive televisions, one computer, and what again has he spot? Then iPhones, he has put two of us, one iPhone 11 in a toilet. And that is in the, uh, in the water closet. Then they have mother's iPhone 7 also in the water closet. Now, if you don't understand something about marriage, about children, you know what would have done? You would have beaten him till you broke his leg or broke his hand. But he's just two years. He's just two years. You, you understand? He's just two years. He doesn't even know what he's doing. And so if you don't learn about children, and you didn't even know, and these are expensive stuff, you go, you beat that child. At the end of the day, it means that you lack knowledge about how to handle children. And so you have to be intentional about it. You have to read about parenting. You have to know about parenting. That's why we are doing this program. To know about the, the, the mechanisms of children, how children behave. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So you have to be intentional about it. Then the reality of the sinful nature I was talking about that. You don't teach a child certain things, but the child knows it. The child will know it. The, Ella can lie, not because I taught her to lie. It's the sinful nature of Adam. And she has changed. And God's grace. <laughs> David, if you see David bullying the sister, uh, uh, Pearl, you ask yourself, where did he learn that is the nature of Adam? So there are certain things you don't teach the child, but because of the sinful nature of Adam, the child picks it. That is why the parents are there to guide the child, to tell the child that, yes, you may have the sinful nature of Adam in you, but it is not good to bully, it is not good to lie, it is not good to steal, it is not good to convert somebody's property. You are teaching the child the God's way, even though the child has the sinful nature. Because when you look at the Bible, the Bible says what? There is foolishness in the heart of the child, but the rod of correction. So that is where it is important that you correct the child, build the child, beat the child if necessary. I'm talking about punishing the child if necessary, just so that you can be able to correct that child of the foolishness in his heart. Because, you see, let me tell you something about parenting. Now, no parent is perfect. No parent is perfect. I'm not perfect. 
My wife, mommy is not perfect. We are all not perfect. That is why you have to keep learning. You have to keep learning. And so, one of the things I want to say, if mommy, if you want to come, you just let me. One of the things about parenting, okay, godly parenting or kingdom parenting is that if you are not intentional, if you are not intentional about parenting your children, there are four things that will parent your ch child for you. One, your mate. For those of you who have mate, because anybody who your child spends more than four hours or five hours is an automatic parent to your child. So when we send our children to school, the teachers there are parents, the secondary agents there, who are parenting your child. So if so, that is why Ella, who come from the school, do you know what comes into her mind? Tattoo. Go and find out. You see that the teacher has a tattoo. So the tattoo on the teacher makes it nice for her. And because she sees the teacher as a secondary teacher, as a secondary parent, she sees the tattoo on the body. So sometimes she will come, she will put the marker. Sometimes, then another time, she moves from grade three to grade four. She sees this teacher. These are not a tattoo alone. But she sees another teacher with pierced lips. Then she sees double hair. She sees other things. She thinks it's nice. She comes from school one day. You see her put a fish out because she knows how bitter. She put a fish one in her lips. She put because she's seeing the secondary parent as normal. So if you don't teach them the godly way of saying no, sometimes she, she will, Ella is somebody, sometimes she can ask you a question and you get scared. In fact, they were supposed to stay in Europe. We have to change our mind. We changed our mind 360. Because the questions Ella will ask you, you will be scared. Sometimes she will come and say, uh, to bring philosophical questions that I don't believe that God exists. And she will raise argument. You will be shocked. Argument to tell you based on Scientology. You know where she's learning from? From her security. For, uh, 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 Parent, which is the teacher. Do, 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 do you understand? So you have to always teach them the way of the Lord and sit them down and teach them the word of God. If you don't teach them, their teachers will do it for you. Then they mate. So if that mate, there are many maid servants who were gays, lesbians, who taught people's children or even give them witchcraft or something because anybody that your child spends more than four or five hours with is an automatic parent to your child. So the maid servant will teach your child for you if you don't teach them. The teacher will teach for you, then guess what? Social media. Social media will also teach the child for you. If you don't sit them down to teach them, social media will teach them. Sometimes David will watch some things on, on phone. That cartoon, David. Then sometimes you'll be there, no, he'll slap you. Because he thinks he's, he's playing with that, that the people there are human beings. <laughs> you understand? So what he's learning, na, 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 na. or sometimes in the cartoon, you see the people naked. So when he hears the song, no, you see, you take off all his panties, then you will jump in. Because he thinks the people, the cartoon he's seeing, they are real human beings. So if you don't teach him, the cartoon will teach him. If you don't teach him, the teacher will teach him. Then television. TV will teach him. You should see Pearl. Hello, Dan. What can I do for? Where is she learning from? TV. Daddy, tell me I'm beautiful. Am I not beautiful, Daddy? You say you are beautiful. Sometimes even David, he will do something and I'll praise him. Oh, David, thank you. Yeah, good job, Daddy. Or oh, if you are bringing milk, I said, David, milk for you. Good job, Daddy. TV. <laughs> you, 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 you understand? So if you don't teach them the way of the Lord, all these tools we are talking about will teach your children for you. And so you have to be intentional because parenting is so powerful and very influential. So if you don't exert your influence on your children, other things will do it for you. Okay? 
So who parents your child is very important. Now, in, 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 in parenting also, or kingdom parenting, one of the things the child expects from you is to create not just a godly environment, but to create an environment of protection for the child. The child should know that I am protected. My mother and father protects me. Because if you look at uh, God's plan for the family unit, the reason why God created the family unit is so that the mother will protect the child and the father will also protect the child. That is why the child believes that he can do every nonsense and get away with it so long as mommy and daddy are around. Because the child must feel protected. You understand? Uh -huh. And so what we are saying is that you can never say you are successful. You may have a car, mansions, and everything. You may be the most richest person on this earth. But if you fail in raising godly children, if you fail in the family, for instance, mommy and I, we are pastors. We pastor a church that has branches. Now, if we fail in pastoring these children to come up in the fear of the Lord, we have failed in everything else. It doesn't matter the name, the recognition, and how people respect that. We have failed. And so that is why it is important that you take the family unit very serious. And so let me mention some few things that parents, in terms of godly parents, what are they supposed to do? Now, there are certain laws in the home that every parent must follow. One of them is that you have to train the child, guide the child, because your training of the child is what helps in shape, shaping the attitude of the child, how the child behaves even when it goes outside. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. You have to train the child on good ethics and good manners. It's important. There are some children, when you do something, they can't say thank you because they are not really good. They think they deserve it. So you have to teach them in this good ethics, good manners of how the child should behave to elderly people. I was in Geneva years ago, I was telling mommy. And I met one child on the train that I knew. We were all staying in the same house. I saw her with the thinking she would get close to me in the train. She stood there. She saw me. I waved there. She said, yeah. I got down at where I was supposed to get there. I walked there. She didn't get there at that point. She went and got there. So I don't know where she went to. Then she came back later. So I told the mother that, I, I saw your daughter on the same train uh, with me. She said, yeah. So what happened? I said, I greeted your daughter. I was waiting her to come so that we... She didn't remind me. Then the mother said, I should talk to her. I talked, talk, talk, talk use scripture, talk to her. Do you know what she told me? She looked at me and she said, where are you? I said, I'm in Europe. Then she asked me, where are you coming from? I said, I'm coming from Africa. Then she told me that that's why you are Africa, you are not developed. I said, why? She said, you're insulting me. This is totally direct. <laughs> then she said to me that, you Africans, you think children's, children don't matter. Like, they don't matter in opinion. And that is why you people are not developing. I said, I listened to her. And so, if you don't teach the child good ethics and good manners, these are some of the things that will happen. You, you understand? It, it will, because you need to shape the child's attitude on how to behave outside when you meet even strangers and visitors. So you study that mommy trains Ella and go when visitors come. She doesn't even want the children around visitors. She Ella, you have to train the child. You, you understand what I'm saying? So then you have to also train the child how to be obedient to authority. And that is where a lot of parents will fail. Because we pamper the children too much. Is that we give them whatever they want. So you have to teach that child to be obedient to authority. So if it means ensuring that the order you are giving to the child, you ensure that the child carries out that order. Number two, you if you have to even discipline the child, you have to make sure that you carry out 
the discipline and make sure that the child obeys your instruction. Because if you say, I will punish you and you, I will beat you, and the child sees that, ah. you know, something happened earlier in a year, months ago. She did something and I beat her. Then later I came to apologize to her. You know what she told me? Oh, daddy, I was expecting you to beat me, but look at me. I know you should have beaten me, so I would have been surprised if you didn't beat me. That's what she told me. So, children, they know that what he, she did is wrong. So she's expecting you to beat her. You, 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 you understand what I'm saying? So immediately you don't beat her, you say, I will beat you. She says, I, I've done it. Mommy has been beating me. Beating is always postponed. I will beat you tomorrow. It's postponed. Now the child sees that normal. Oh, this woman or this man. Anytime I will beat you, he doesn't beat me. I will beat you, he doesn't beat me. The child. So you have to be intentional about making sure that the child is obedient to authority. If it, if it means you have to beat the child. And so, the problem of a lot of parents is that they treat the child as if they are equal. Sometimes parents can sit down and be sharing intimate secrets with the child. Your child is not your equal. He's your child. Your child, you and your child, you are not peers to be discussing your marital issue with your child or discussing issues of family with your child. Your child is not your peer. Your child is your child. And so, you, on social media, sometimes you see some children, then you see the child slap the mother. Then the mother will be crying, then the child will be beating the mother, and the child will be shouting. Eh. You do that in Africa, you are dead. You understand? And so, your child is not your equal. Your child is not your peer. Your child is your child. So, when you have to discipline the child, you discipline the child. You, you understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So you have to teach the child to respect other people. You have to teach the child to respect the law of the country. All these things are all principles that you have to teach the child. You have to teach the child that there is a punishment for disobedience to parents. And so if you want to preserve the next generation of the children that are coming, then we have to be intentional about parenting these children. And also, as a parent, you have to pray for your children every day. Every day. You have to pray for your children every day. Because when your children go out there, you don't know what he or she is doing. So you have to pray for him or her every day. You know, and also talking to the children every day. It's very important. Correcting them. Yeah. You have to correct them. You know, many parents fail. You don't do that. That's why now you see children doing what they are doing. They, they like, yes. Yeah. So as a parent, you have to correct your children. If you have to be beaten on him or her, you have to do that. You have to shout on him or her to stop whatever he's doing. You have to, for him or she to know that what he's doing is wrong. Yeah. What he's doing is wrong. And also teaching them the word of God. And, and it's, it's important because you see, what mommy is saying, the, the reason why you, the parent, also you need to know the word of God is because you will not have it 100%. Sometimes you should see when Ella and the mother are displaying. And sometimes I have to call her and say, This one, wait till when she's been 16. This one, you're not missing anything. You understand what I'm saying? Aha. Uh -huh. And so, there are times the way you want your children to go, they don't want to be going that way. And so you need the word of God, even you, yourself, the mother, the father, so that you don't give up. Because see, you can the child can go wayward or go in the direction that you didn't plan. And you can be discouraged that in God has lost this child. But the more of the word of God inside you, you will help you not to give up on the child. 
and to continue to pray for the child until God rescues that child like the prodigal son and to bring that child back to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that is why it is even more important for you, the parent, to really know the word of God. Or else when the challenges start with your children, you, if you don't take time, you will really curse your own children because of the pain you are going through with them. And so it is important that you yourself also you learn and study the word of God. It's important. Yes. Why are the generation failed or why are the generation not succeeding? You want to come exactly okay. why uh, this generation have failed in terms of a lot of deviant, a lot of uh, prostitution and the beginning of our
our parents didn't help us. So we have to fight. If the grace of God is not, that it is not rescue you, that means that you have to do things by your own. You see, so it's very important that as a child, or as we nation and parents, we have to uh, be in the presence of God and pray for our nation, for that God will rescue the children of today and the generation, our generation, because we are failing. <laughs> Let me, let me add to what mommy said. This generation is from two sides. What this generation wants. You know what this generation wants. You know their problem. This generation wants... They, they, they want... From, from leader's perspective... Let me, let me say it in two ways. To people like me who is a leader... And studying this generation, I have four things about this generation. Then I will also say four things that they also want from this time as this generation. The first thing about I as a leader studying this generation that number one, this generation is lazy. Lazy. That's one. Number two, this generation has a sense of entitlement. You know what is entitlement? Entitlement means that they go into any organization and they have this sense of entitlement that I, I deserve this thing, even though they have not worked for it. So they go into an organization, it's like, I deserve to be treated this way. I deserve to own a car. I deserve all this. Thing. Forgetting the values that you don't deserve anything. You understand? You don't deserve anything. And those of you in the UAE understand me better than Africa. In Africa, I've, I've, I've been an entrepreneur in a small way. You put somebody in charge of a business. The business collapses. And the person have a sense of entitlement that even though your business has collapsed, you should still send me salary. That is this generation for you. It's a sense of entitlement. I'm entitled to this even though your business has collapsed. So long as I am overseeing your collapsed business, you still have to pay me for it. That is why this generation, if you, they, they stop you at, at first, do you know that you could help somebody, maybe push a car or even Senko will tell you, those days, when a taxi driver, you, your car stopped and maybe your battery is low, you could stop a taxi driver and he will just use a jumper or put his battery in your car and spark it. This generation is not like that, though. Mm -hmm. He puts his battery in your car. He tells you, sir, before I put the battery in the car, you pay 50 dirham. So he has a sense of entitlement that he's helped you. He's coming to play the keyboard. He needs an appreciation of the keyboard he's coming to play. He doesn't see that he's playing for God. He's coming to do anything for you, even as a pastor. He's, he has a sense of entitlement that once I am coming to the pastor, or I am coming to this person, I need to be paid for my service. That is the entitlement, the sense of entitlement. The person has a sense of entitlement. Then the next thing I will say is that they are selfish. This generation, all they think about themselves is me, the me. It's all about me. They are so. This generation is the most self-aggrandizing, selfish generation I have ever seen. I'm telling you, it is all about them. Whatever they are doing, when they are even doing something for the ministry, for instance, you put somebody in charge of choir. He's not thinking about the choir as a church choir. He's thinking about how to build loyalty in the choir to himself. So the day he rebels, nobody will come to the choir and come and sing. So he's not thinking about so selfish, so much selfishness. He's coming to give an offering. He's thinking about himself first. So that tight he's bringing is not actually tight. It's not tight that he's bringing. He's bringing something that makes him comfortable. So. Even the love that you think they are loving you is not real love. It doesn't love you. 
He loves you because he can get something from you. He's around you because he can get something from you. That is the generation of today. So much selfishness. They are so selfish. You understand? So that is this generation. So number one, they have a sense of entitlement. They are lazy. And they are selfish and unfocused. They are not focused in life. This generation asks you, Evans is sitting there right now, asks him what he wants to do. Today you tell him, I want to play football. You intentionally wait uh, three months, call him again. Evans, what do you want to do? I want to go into IT. Call him after six months. Ask him, Evans, what do you want to do? Um, I tell him, I want to go to America. I want to go to America. You, you see, they, they are on focus. They don't really, they don't really know. You see, they don't know how to differentiate this generation. You know their problem. They can't differentiate between want and need. And many of the things they they crave for is not actually need. It is actually want. And what they forget is that life does not give you what you want. Life will only give you what you need. It's like Ella is nine years or ten years, and Ella comes to me and says, "Daddy, give me your car key. I want to drive to Granite." That is a want. You think she's there, she doesn't feel like driving. She wants to drive, but it's a want. What does Ella really need? What Ella really needs is for her to go to her books, for me to buy her things that she can use in learning. And that is what she really needs, not to drive a car. And so this generation, they cannot tell the difference between what they need and what they want. Now, this generation, do you know what they also say about the older folks? This is their, 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 you meet them and their, and you know their, their, their conversation. Even and go, and, and when they meet to talk, this is how they talk. They want to make an impact. So those of them in ministry, as they sit down there, think, they say, I want to really make an impact. I want to make an impact. Hey, the way me, I will touch my well there. I want to make an impact. But they forget that impact does not just come. It's not just about you talking about it that you want to make an impact. There is a process. There is a process. And you see, they want to make an impact, but they are not ready to go through the process. That is this generation. They want to make an impact that they are not ready to go through any process. It's like, you know, one of their problems of this generation is instant gratification. You know what is instant gratification? I'll come to that. It's like, I want to be rich now. I want to buy a Range Rover now. I want to buy a house now. I want to build a house now. I want a big church now. Everything is about time. Instant. I need it. I need it. I need it now. Everything is about now. And so, this generation, they want to make an impact. But in the impact, they are not ready to go through the process. Then this generation, you know, you know their problem. They want everything free. That's the problem of this generation. They want everything free. They want free food. Free renter. They want, if they want everything free, this generation. That's why this generation, if you like, give them everything for free. They will never be happy. I'm telling you, because they want everything free. This generation, oh, at the, at the point they'll marry free. Wait and see. They want everything free. So they come to church. The first thing they are looking for, ah, this church people don't sell food. You know they sell food for you. They don't give food for you. They don't give item 13 for you. Because that's the generation for you. They want everything free. But they, they forget that things don't just come on a silver platter. Now, one of the things about this generation that will shock you, look at David, two years, the things he can do. Look at Evans, the things today, because of Evans, the sound has changed. This generation will be amazed the things they can do show the things they can do. And so this generation is the most talented 
and blessed generation you can ever think about. And yet, they are the most miserable generation. And so, most of the things is not their fault. And that is why, that is one of the things I'm coming to. All these things I'm talking about, bashing them, it's not their fault. Eh? This generation is not their fault. You know why? The first fault is what Moses spoke about. Failed parenting. Many of this generation, the problem is that their parents failed to raise them. So all you are seeing, all these things I'm complaining about are defect of failed parenting. Look at me, for instance, as an example. I grew up in an environment where my, my father gave me alcohol. I grew up in an environment where I saw my father uh, beat my stepmother. I saw my uncles beat their wives. Now, what do you think it would have made me? It would have made me a, it would have made me a wife beater. Do you understand? So, and one thing about family unit is that the child grows up and everything the child learns is from the parents. And so if this child grows up, listen to me carefully, if this child grows up, everything is the same becomes the planting of the child in his mind, everything. And so if the child is learning all these virtues and moral values and the parents are not able to control the child and to tell the child that this one is not a godly way. This is not how to go about it. What do you think will happen? The child grows up to see that it is normal. Another problem of failed parenting. The parents tell the child, you are, you are special. There's nothing wrong about telling the child that you are special. But as you are telling the child that you are pretty, you are beautiful, but beauty does not put food on your table. So with your beauty, add value to your beauty by studying your books. This generation, parents don't tell their parents. They don't tell their children. All they tell the child is that you are pretty, pretty. So she's growing up, even in the classroom, she's taking selfie. My mom say, I'm pretty. I am pretty. I'm pretty. So the child does not take her book serious and she's stealing the mother's cosmetics to school because all the things the mother is telling her is that you are pretty. And so she thinks that to succeed in life, it takes pretty. So she becomes a prostitute. She becomes a slave queen because that is the fundamentals that was taught to the child that she is pretty. Many teachers today the child, does, the child clocks, let's say in the class of 20, the child gets 18th position. The mother comes and calls the teacher. You, this teacher, you don't like my child. Why do you give my child 18? Why do you give my child 18? You know what happens the next step? The child gets 10th position. And when the other teachers ask the teacher of the child, they say, ah, we know this child is not that good. How come you give her ten? Is the mother? I don't want the mother's trouble, so I just give the child ten so that the mother will get off my back. So the child grows up and realizes that she did not end that third position. You, are you understanding me? This generation, the problem is that the child is last. Do you know that this generation, if you are last, they give you a medal for coming last. Because they say it's psychological, so the child doesn't feel. So the child grows up only to realize that being last in life is not like being first in life. It's different. Being last in life is different from being first in life. So the, the child grows up only to realize that she is not fit for society because she has always been last and she's been given medal for coming last. Life doesn't give you a medal for coming last. And so Failed parenting starts or comes when we don't tell the children the truth. Trying to pamper them and trying to make them feel all good. 
even though they are not doing well, even though they are not learning, oh, my daughter, don't worry. No. If the child is not doing the right thing, the child has to be penalized. Now, one of the aspects of failed parenting also that parents have failed in is that we've not been able to teach the children to tell them that you can't have it your way. Today, you take your child, the child comes, Daddy, can I have this? The child gets it. Daddy, can I have this? The child gets it. So we are breeding a generation where the children want everything they get. But we must teach them to tell them that you can't have everything you want. You can't have it just because you want it. If you want it, work hard for it. You want a car? Work hard for it. You want a house? Work hard for it. You want a good marriage? Work hard for it. You don't tell the child that, oh, you can get everything you want in this world. You can achieve anything. Yes, you can achieve anything, but work on it. Sitting down to watch television is not going to make you productive. Sitting down to watch television five hours on social media and other things is not going to grow your mind and build your mind and capacity to be able to get whatever you want in life. If we can be able to tell the children these hard truths, the child will not grow up having expectations and later realize that I've been told lies all these years. And that is why they go to the office and the boss tells him you are, like for instance, in my office I've had experiences where colleagues will tell me they do a report and the, the, your boss reads the report and says, ah, which school did you go to? Yeah, and you tell me you have a master's degree. master's degree. Because, and, and you know what, then the boss starts talking and he match the work then they go into their office and they cry like babies. And this is a mother of two. You know why? Because she grew her entire life into that you are good. <laughs> you understand? And so they get into society and they realize that they don't fit in. Because they have been told lies their entire life. That you are good. You are excellent. And that is where many of the parents have failed. They tell her she's you are pretty. So she goes into the marriage, she thinks pretty is what to sustain your marriage. But a joke. So after two years, the man packs her out of the house. Only for her to come back to the mother, for her to be told that, ah, and that song, how did they say it? Because the mother or the father didn't tell her that. We don't take beauty to marriage. Then the next problem is technology. Technology has also played a major role. Do you know that in our father's time, they also had problems of uh, addiction. And the problem of our fathers of addiction was dif is different than this generation. Let me explain why. In our father's time, they had issues of depression, stress, okay? And one of the ways they dealt with rejection, stress, and other things was the bottle. Either they, they drank alcohol to release stress or uh, drugs, maybe uh, uh, weed or other things. But this generation, you don't see a lot of weed and alcohol. This generation, what they are addicted to is the Instagram, is the Facebook, Twitter, social media handles. Now, do you know that it has been researched that the average youth today cannot do away with social media? They are, they are so much addicted that when they are even going to sleep, the phone is beside the bed. And sometimes when they hear, because it has become like a dope, like, because they are addicted to social media. That is why when they wake up, the first thing, hi, hi, hi. And they, are, and they, they find fulfillment when you reply them, you reply them back and say, hi. They're excited. That is why on social media they want likes. They want you to like. 
They want acceptance because they feel rejected. That is why they are all the time on uh, what are some of the program guys use? The selfie program. What do you call them? Right? Snapchat. Hello, family. Hello, family. Hello, family. Yeah, this is your girl. This is your girl. This is my picture. I am in I am in Abu Dhabi, Chile. You know why? They want acceptance. It has become an addiction. And so technology that is supposed to help, the social media that is supposed to help, many are becoming more addicted every day. Do you know that in the US, as we speak right now, there are schools and schools and institutions being established to help children and youth out of the addiction of social media? Because let me tell you, some can go on social media night without sleeping. For nights, they can't close their eyes. They're on social media every day. They're addicted to it. So it is no more the alcohol and the other things. So it is social media that is making many of And they're addicted. It's like a dope. It's like when they take tramadol. Social media is like that for them. It's like tramadol for them. And so what I'm saying is that it's making them detach like reality. You look at all these youth who are in the social media. Even their, their smile is fake. They don't, they don't have human emotions. Hello? Oh, because me, I travel a lot, I see it all. When you go, it's like the home is like an artificial home. Hello? That's when you see the children, don't, 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 don't. Hello? They don't have, they don't know what is human, they don't have human touch. They don't have human affection. They are more affectionate. You let their phone get lost. You hide his, his phone. <laughs> my phone, I would die. My phone, my phone. Because the affection is the phone. There's no, there is no human affection. Do you understand? There's no human feeling. So that child can be in the room for months, doesn't see the mother, he doesn't care. So long as he has the phone. And so can go days without eating. Once they have the phone, they are good to go. And so it has, and so it has made more people more depressed because the more they're on the phone, there's no love. The child doesn't know how to even hug the mother, kiss the mother, affection. It is not there because the mother too is on phone, the father is on phone, the child is on phone. Everybody is on the phone. So addiction has also brought failure. And so many of the values the child is learning is learning it from social media. From all these celebrities. So the child is becoming addicted. The child behavior, pattern, actions, behavior, everything is learning from one stupid celebrity. Who is shaping the attitude and behavior of this child. Recently, my daughter started behaving very funny. She was going to put some nails. No, no, no. I said, what is happening here? So I started researching. By the time I could say Jack, then I, I heard of uh, one Kadi, Kadi B. I said, in my old, not Kadi B. Are you mad? Kadi B. Role model Kadi B. I had to dissolve everything faster. So she's learning from Kadi B. Kadi B is shaping her attitude. Kadi B is shaping her behavior. Do you understand? Can it be shaping her behavior? So it is important that. And you see, the problem we have in this time is that children no longer have any meaningless friendship. Everything is about social media now. Okay? They don't know how to deal with stress. They learn from social media. And so social media is not helping. It is rather only giving them temporary relief from their stress and from their depression. And so it is important that one of the ways we can help them is to take the phones from them, to be intentional about it. Do you know the average you today? Ask all of them that are sitting here. Even when they are going to interview, they carry their phone with them. Even an interview, something that is crucial to their life, they are still carrying their phone. Interview that they should leave their phone at home 
They will go to an interview and they are carrying even their phone at the interview panel. Because you know why? They have become addicted to the phone. If they don't see the phones, that something is missing out of their life. And it's not, it, has, it has become an addiction. So if you cannot live without the phone for even one hour, you have a big you have a problem. But you don't know you have a problem. You have a big problem. You have a very, very big problem. It is you are not you are not better than somebody who drinks alcohol. You and him. The difference is that he drinks alcohol. You, your alcohol is the social media. That's the difference between them. The, the person who you are calling that takes tremador, you are not different from the person who takes tremador. The only difference is that he takes tremador. Your, your, you, your tremador is the social media. So you are not better than the person who takes tremador or alcohol. The two of you are the same. The only challenge is that you are, your, your, your dope is the social media. His dope is the... Uh, uh, let me end on. Let me find out. Then the next one is the instant gratification. Today, they can sit on their computer and order for French fries. It comes. Delivery. Delivery. Pizza is there. So now, that's why I'm saying that they have become the lazy generation because they can sit in their sofa and they can order anything from any part of the world and to come to them. So, so that is why you see this generation. Now, they have to pay money to go to the gym. And so you see that they are working. <laughs> because in their comfort of their bed, they can do everything. <laughs> so they have this sense of instant gratification. I want it now. I need it now. It doesn't work that way. Then the, last, the, the next one is impatience. This generation is impatient. Oh, they are impatient. They don't have patience for anything. They don't have patience for anything. They are, they are not patient at all, this generation. They are not patient. If you want any generation that is not patient, is this this generation? They, they are impatient. Ah. I want it now. I want to get married. I'm growing. I need to get married. It is, it is so difficult for this generation of no idea. They cannot be patient and wait for their time. They are serving under the man of God. They have to break away and go and start their own church. They are serving under a master. They have to break away and go and, and, go and start their own something. They are so impatient. They want to be rich overnight. They want everything overnight. They cannot be patient until it gets to their time. They cannot be patient. And so this generation, the reason why they are failing is because of impatience. That is why you see people go committing suicide. Because they are depressed. Because they, they, you see, the problem of the social media is that you watch people who go into social media. It has been researched that out of 10 people that go to social media, 9 of them are depressed all the time. You know why? You know why? People who don't go to social media don't get depressed. People who go to social media are always depressed. You know why? Because by the time you get to social media, you are seeing your friends who are living a fake life with fake Brazilian hair, fake hair, fake buttocks, fake eyes, fake everything. And you are watching it. And your mind is like, hey, so I try to go ahead of me. Oh. Hey, so I'm a failure. I'm a failure. So by the time they spend more time on social media, they become more depressed in their lives. But if I'm not on social media, I don't see your fake life for me to be depressed. I don't, I don't see your fake life for me to be worried about it. And so people who go on social media are more depressed than people who don't go on social media. And so because of that, they become impatient. They can't wait until their time. Hey, my catch you. Hey, people have gone ahead of you. I need to die. I need to die. So they commit suicide. They become depressed. They are never happy. They are never content. Even when God is blessing them, they are never content with what God is giving to them. And that is how come many of them, they go into alcoholism, they go into drinking, they go into drugs and other things because they are never content. Then the next one is the environment. Okay? The environment also contributes to their failure. Look at the environment that we are in today. 
You see, that was what mommy talked about, about leadership, about politicians, pastors. Politicians, pastors, all of them contribute to the environment. What are the policies taken that favors these children and favors this generation? Many politi poli policies that are chosen or taken in parliament or other legislative legislations are to favor the politician. So the politician is not thinking about the generation or the youth or the people. He's thinking about his own selfish gain. The politician is using the money to sleep with a 16-year-old child, an 18-year-old child, abuse that child, sleep with that child, rape that child. So what kind of environment are we creating? So the environment also is making them to fail. The educational systems. How is the educational system designed? Where you go to school is true and poor. Pass and forget. So once you go to the school, yours is to chew. So you have their poor. True and poor. If there is no system where you are trained how to be able to come out and you are entrepreneurial and you can say, well, I'm starting a business on my own to start or I am trying to do something. You are not taught all these things. You are taught this theory that go, you are taught in a way that you are finishing school to carry a file and go and look for a job. So the environment also doesn't help. So people are not giving any social skills, social abilities to be able to learn on the job. Learn some uh, carpentry, learn some entrepreneurial skills that will be able to help them when they finish school so they don't sit at their home and say, For oh, five years I'm jobless. Mm -hmm. At least I can do something, I can learn something. And so it is, it is important and imperative that the environment, if that's what Mongo said, that even the church environment is not helping. So the environment is very important. And these are the few things I can say that is one of the main reasons why uh, this generation has failed. You were, you were not asking your questions and you would like to answer you. Yeah. Um, I think we will reserve that one. We we'll reserve that one for that. Today we are talking about, about parenting. parenting. Yeah, so we don't we don't drift. We don't drift. Yes, we are today we're talking about parenting. So any other thing that is aside that is gonna be fun that time. Um I would like you or Mama to Mama to wait the give us your last word. Thank you. What are you? On that day, God is going to ask you, not the family or the grandma. God is going to ask you. That's what I think. Papa, anything you want to give us out there? Well, what, what I would say is that we all contribute to the failure of this generation. And the only way it can be solved is when we start looking at all these things. Instead of blaming them, blaming the youth, blaming this generation. We have to look at what are we doing which is not helping. You see, which is not helping. And once we correct those ills, especially the environment that we create, it will help. It will help a lot. The environment we create will help a lot. Thank you so much,
Okay, can we share with the prayer? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the privilege to be able to educate and to be able to bring development in human capacity to parents out there. We know that no, pa no parent is perfect, and so we pray for wisdom that you will help us as parents to be able to raise godly, kingdom-minded children. We ask that every assignment of the enemy concerning our children we cancel by the power of the blood. We cover the children with the blood of Jesus. We ask that the hand of Elohim preserve these children. May the presence of the Holy Ghost go before these children. We come against every attack on the children. And we ask that the hand of the Lord will be strong upon them. In Jesus' precious name, I call it down. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, viewers. Until we come your way again next week, Friday, the live from the series.